Hello. Um, I'd like to first apologize for the lack of an interesting font here. Um, I think it got lost when I transferred the file, but I didn't choose Times New Rome. <laughs> um, but yeah, my name is Jake Elwes, and I'm going to start when we're surrounded by all of this code and these amazing screens. It's my first time at the ZKM. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and being surrounded by all of this ethereal data that we don't usually get to see and seeing the traces of them on these screens up here, I wanted to start with something really primitive and some of my investigations into the materiality of this technology that we're using on a day-to-day -day basis. So these here are some prints that I was making um, of circuit boards where I've taken a really traditional artistic process. And this is, I guess, coming from a really old traditional art school background where I was the only person coding in the basement. And I wanted to take full advantage of using these beautiful traditional printing presses, Victorian printing presses they had there. And it's, yeah, basically I've scorched these circuit boards and, and put them through this printing press. And to me, they're kind of like these aerial images of, of scorched landscapes. Um, here are some prints where I was considering this virtual world that we all have in our pockets and thinking about how we interface um, with these devices. So this is the grease. The center one is the grease of my beard on the surface of the glass of my iPhone, um, which I then print as these really large, um, very painterly images. Um, so that is me making a phone call. So you can see the sort of swipe of my thumb as I answer a phone call. Um, the one on the, on the right is Tinder. So it's all the left and right swipes as, I think, as I'm using Tinder. Um, here are a couple of, of iPhone apps that I was making. So I guess this is, yes, what I'm thinking about is a lot is, is the, the physicality of, of, of these devices and looking at the circuitry inside the phone and what's making these algorithms that are running our lives possible all the time. So this bottom one is an iPhone app that I've made where you touch the surface of the screen that starts to reveal the circuitry underneath the phone and then you hold down your finger and it starts to reveal the world through your phone as well. So it takes the camera feed. Um, and then finally, so I'm just running through a few of my older pieces before I get on to the more machine learning based work. Um, so this is the whispering of, of tweets that are going on in a physical circumference around the installation of this Raspberry Pi. So it overlays all of the tweets that are coming through on top of each other and you get this kind of strange soundscape of everything in an actual geographic area around the installation of the piece. So, okay, so now I want to talk about how I started to get into machine learning. Um, so I was in Berlin a few years ago and I met some really inspirational people. So there was an amazing mentor called Gene Kogan um, and I met the wonderful Memo Atkin who's in the room at the moment, who's gonna talk tomorrow. And these artists were considering how we can use these techniques. And I guess a couple of years ago, using these techniques, it was no easy feat. I think now these technologies have become a lot more accessible and a lot more artists are trying to investigate how you can use them in creative ways. Um, and I guess I'm thinking about what it means to be an artist using machine learning algorithms. And so many questions arise of agency and you know, where, where the artist's role is really when you're using algorithms that are taking, producing results that you can't really predict and where you're where the ownership is, where the agency is, you know, how far you can push these questions, and also the underlying questions that exist in machine learning all the time of the ethics behind them, who owns the data, where are these data sets coming from that we're using all the time. Um, so for this first project that I created in collaboration with someone called Roland Arnold on this course with Gene was um, a reference to a seminal piece of video art, um, Namjoon Pike's TV Buddha, which, is everyone familiar with this piece? It's a wonderful piece of video art. So it's the Buddha staring at a camera, 
showing the image of the Buddha. Um, and what I wanted to do was create a version which was trained on a data set of images of the Buddha. Um, and this was fairly early iteration of what's called a GAN, a generative adversarial network. So it's a neural network that you train on thousands and thousands of images, and it starts to learn features from those images. Um, and what was really fascinating to us here is that we didn't really have the technical knowledge at the time to create a realistic representation of the Buddha. But what we liked is that it was the Buddha staring at a machine learning algorithm trying to create a reflection of the Buddha. And it completely failed. Um, and that was lovely to us. That was where the poetry was. And I think that's what's interesting about being an artist working in the field is that you're looking for the mistakes. You're looking for what's poetic. There's all this research coming out, and there's so much fruit ripe for the picking that you can just you know, find online and this amazing research going on all around the world. And every day there's a new paper in like some new method of generating images using machine learning. Um, but if you can find the poetry in what these algorithms were not intended to do, possibly. Um, so this is like you know, the first iteration of a DC GAN when it hasn't really been trained fully. We weren't training it for long enough. I think we had 8,000 images of the Buddha, um, and we didn't really have the hardware to create a realistic image. So it generates images like this, which to me are very painterly. They're kind of these wonderful abstract artifacts of the computer's early attempt at generating something representational. Um, and then, yeah, we put it with the Buddha. So that was my first attempt at using machine learning with art. Um, my second attempt was there's this um, interesting researcher in San Francisco, Gabriel Go, who found that you can link Yahoo's algorithm for generating, well, so Yahoo created an algorithm for classifying pornography and removing images from their search engine. Um, images with explicit content. And what was really interesting is that you could feed it into a generative network um, and get basically back engineer the algorithm to generate its idea of the most pornographic porn. So this was an attempt, a video attempt, at getting the computer to generate its image of the most pornographic porn. You see it starts to get quite... What was weird about this video is that when I put it up on YouTube and Vimeo, it got removed um, for being pornographic. But there's no pornography in this. This is just what's left behind. So you train an algorithm on thousands and thousands of images, of actual explicit images, um, and it learns features of those. And then this is, it starts from noise, and it tries to trick the discriminator into thinking this is a real image of pornography. Um, and what's interesting is that you're left with just the genitalia, which is what it picks up as the explicit parts of the image. Um, now I'm going to talk about an, uh, another earlier piece that I made, um, which is called Latent Space. So this here, and I think, yeah, we're probably all quite familiar with these sorts of images now. It's become a sort of certain GAN aesthetic as a lot of people are using these algorithms. Um, but for me, it was a really important moment where I would set an algorithm off and I was getting it to generate images which were no longer representational. So this is an algorithm, um, again, so like I said, a, ge a generative adversarial network which has been trained on ImageNet, which is 14 million photographs of all sorts of different classes, of different objects, of everything from birds to toilet seats to trees. And it learns features from each of those categories. And it starts to plot them in this multi-dimensional space that you can control. And you can kind of, I like, I like to visualize this spatially. I mean, we can't imagine 512 dimensions in our head, but we can imagine three dimensions. You can imagine it's kind of plotting all of the trees over here, all of the things with similar features, and all of the birds and other species down here, and all of the human faces over there. Um, what I then got it to do was, uh, you know, it's then capable, once it has plotted all of these images and it can classify these all as trees, which is a very complicated task for a computer, if you think about it. So, like, understand an image from underneath a leaf as the same as an image from, you know, with a tree in the background. 
Um, so once it can classify these images, you can then get it to generate new versions of these different classes. Um, but here, what I got it to do is I didn't want it to do that. I just asked it to generate images around these classes and between them and everything. And I, I'm moving away from this hypersphere and asking it to go on a journey through everything it has learned. Um, and what's interesting to me is that it picks up photographic tropes. It's picking up the rule of thirds um, and horizons and all sorts of interesting things. But they're so painterly. And this is what was great, is that when I was at a painting school, a predominantly painting school, and I was showing people this, they were appalled. They were really shocked that a computer was generating this. And I had no idea what was going to come out when I was setting it off, generating these images. And there were some well-known painting curators that were coming up and seeing this and saying, no, you must have drawn these. You must have painted some of these images. And I think maybe it threatens you know, art critics and people from that background, because they think abstract painting, abstract expressionism is such a human thing. And it's something that a machine shouldn't be capable of reproducing images that look anything of the sort. Um, and yeah, so that was, that was really interesting and important moment for me. Um, now I'm going to talk about a piece which this led on to, which is the piece that is showing here, the ZKM at the moment. It's actually showing twice, which I think is quite cool, quite an achievement to have the same piece showing twice. But it's showing in the permanent exhibition, and it's showing just behind me here. Um, and what this piece is doing is it's a conversation between two models. So there's one model on the right. Um, which is a machine learning network which has been trained to caption images. Um, it's been trained on a million captions of photographs which have been labeled by real humans. And what it's doing is it's saying it's seeing a bird flying in the air in that image, in that last image. And the one on the left is an image generating algorithm which can generate images from sentences which are being fed into it. So these two are having a back and forth discussion in a never ending feedback loop. Um, I call the piece closed loop. So I feel like we're just voyeurs watching these two algorithms communicate with each other. So now it's, it's trying to generate an image of a sky is blue and clear. And when it settles, it will then say what it sees in the previous image. It now sees a bird with a red beak. Um, and then it will try and generate a new image of that. I think what's quite exciting about this for me as well is that a lot of artists are using custom data sets that they're gathering themselves. But for me, what's quite interesting is actually using the standard data set, ImageNet, and seeing how dumb it is, seeing the sorts of things that it sees in itself. Um, and I think also, you know, th this was nearly two years ago, and the algorithms have improved so much now that you can actually generate really quite realistic images of blue jeans on a man. But actually, I think that would ruin the piece in a way, because then it would get stuck in a loop, and it would just see the same thing and generate a realistic image of the thing. And I think, in a way, this is questioning something a lot deeper. It's questioning what creativity is. Um, I don't believe this to be creative, but some people's definition of creativity is the ability to branch off and make something of our mistakes. And I think this is constantly branching off of itself and misinterpreting itself and then creating something new and theoretically original from what it saw in the previous image. Um, so yeah, if you want to watch this piece for longer, it's, it's being exhibited just behind the screen here. I'm going to talk about um, a more recent piece called Cusp, um, which is an, it's a, it's a piece where I was generating images of birds. And this is a, you can see the images are a lot higher quality, a lot more realistic. Um, it's a more recent algorithm that I'm using. The reason I was drawn to generating images of birds is there's a long history of birds in art. Many musicians have been inspired by birds. Um, and I've been going to the Essex Marshes in the UK my entire life, where there's a bird sanctuary. And looking at marsh birds, migratory birds, um, and I, I, I wanted to create this, this juxtaposition of, of 
having artificial life and taking it out into nature and placing it with real birds and having them interact. Um, so these are the sorts of birds that it was generating. And as you can see, some of them have completely broken down into textures where the algorithm can't quite comprehend an individual image of a bird. And it's just starting to see water and mud and the species are sort of disintegrating. None of these birds are real species because none of them were labeled. I trained it on a data set of, I think, about 10,000 images. I fine-tuned it. It was trained originally on images of all species of birds, and I fine-tuned it on species of birds that you would find in that area. Um, but these are all like interspecies birds, which I find fascinating. None of these are real birds that you would find. Some of them have the tail of a godwit and the beak of a curlew, um, or you know, the body of a shank and the feathering of a curlew, whatever it is. And I find that fascinating, and also evolutionary, how many of these birds wouldn't be able to exist in nature, how they have sort of three legs. Um, and yes, so, so I'll show you. So what I did is I took them out into the marsh um, on, on a little projected screen, and I projected it across the water with the... What's also interesting is that the, um, all of the birds were generating in profile, because that was how the algorithm found it easiest to comprehend the shape and form of a bird, um, which I find interesting in relation to art history, where humans would try and comprehend the natural world in caves by always painting elephants in profile um, or early species in nature. So this is, yes, you can see the birds in the background. There's a whole group of Brent geese. Um, the audio is also generated using machine learning, so it's completely synthetic audio. Generating audio is actually a very complicated task from scratch. Um, you're generating samples, you've got like 16,000 samples a second that have to relate temporally to everything that came before it. Um, and it took quite a long time for engineers to work out the best way of doing this. But yeah, it was trained on three hours of field recordings in the area and then it's being generated now. The last shot is there. There's a flock of birds. So I guess with all of this, it's, it's interesting to consider what the artist's role is when using these algorithms. Um, I'm thinking, there's a wonderful diagram here of Max Tegmark, um, where he's put the different roles that humans are going to be capable of, or, or that algorithms will be doing in the future. I guess we're kind of up to go at the moment. Um, speech recognition and chess. He's put art on a little mountain there, which I, I quite like. Um, I suppose that's the thing. For me, it's very much still in a history of systems and conceptual art, what we're doing here. There's no actual agency of the machine. It's just a tool. I think it's really interesting to use it to ask these philosophical questions of where we could be in the future. Um, but I don't really believe that these algorithms are making creative moves. I, they're dumb. You know, it's up to an artist to set them off doing something interesting conceptually. Um, so yeah, no, I suppose that was a big controversy recently with the art auction with Obvious, where they were maybe overclaiming the role of the algorithm and claiming it had full autonomy. And I suppose that's the thing that the artist had a decision in curating the data set that was inputted into it, you can change the parameters of the network, and all the hyperparameters, and then you curate the output that comes out of it as well. So in fact, the artist is very much in charge of these techniques and what you're doing with them. Um, so yeah, there's a couple of books that I really recommend as well. Um, Life 3.0 by Max Tegmark especially. Some really interesting thought experiments in that. Going to probably skip past this one. Well, this is a little project that I did um, a while back with Roland Arnold as well, um, where we were making haikus from a live news feed. Um, and again, I, I like the fact that it's pointing out the naivety and 
you know, how, how dumb these algorithms are without us, that they're picking up our biases, but we have nothing to be fearful of the algorithms themselves. It's the data sets, it's the biases that we are feeding into them and how we are using them. Um, so I like the fact that this captioning algorithm was looking at images of burning drugs in Pakistan and seeing a small patch of dirt and yellow flowers, and it's labeling uh, Hillary Clinton as a pink shirt on a woman and the Pope as a man with glasses. Um, this is my final slide. I just want to show a bit of this video. This is a, a supercut that I made of tech CEOs, um, all white men in America, um, cis white men, talking in numbers. So five, I'm just going to show a bit five, of that. Five, five, four, five, and four. One, six, six, seven, 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 eight, eight, nine, nine, five thousand. One billion, one thirty million, one hundred million, two billion, one, two hundred. Two hundred fifty, seventy, one. Ten thousand, one hundred fifty, ten thousand, eighteen thousand, one hundred fifty. Sixteen. Sixteen. Two, three hundred fifty, twenty hundred, seven. Two, two, two. Twenty, three hundred fifty, fifty. Ten hundred fifty, more. Nine thousand. Nine thousand, one thousand. One, six billion. Hundred million, hundred million, one hundred million. Six hundred, one hundred million. One, one, ten billion. Five, thirty million. One, three, two. 27 million to 100. One. One. Five, 30,000. Zero. One. Ten. Ten thousand. Ten thousand. Three. Three. Three or four hundred billion. One trillion. Three hundred and eighty to three hundred and fifty thousand. Three hundred and fifty. Four. Four. Twenty. Ten. One. Three trillion. Seventeen. Four hundred trillions. And five millions. One. Tens of thousands. Millions. And five hundred billion. Fifteen. Four. Six trillion. Two million. Five thousand. Fifty billion. Sixty. Four. Fifty five. One billion. Eighty. Forty. Ten. Zero. Three. One. Four hundred million. Four billion. One. Four billion 1980s. One, one four billion 1980s. Three hundred million, ten fifteen billion. Thirteen thousand, one thousand five hundred, one thousand five hundred twenty-five million, one billion billion, billion billion two billion two seven billion four four billion one 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 eighty five ten ten four hundred million twenty four forty five one tens five 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 hundred billion two hundred fifteen hundred thousand hundred one two three a twenty two thirty one two thousand sixty five thousand 35 30 35 200,000 265,000 billionaire you want a millionaire 10 930 or 10 100,000 5,000 95,000 13 billion 25 billion 30 billion 25 25 13 13 billion 2 and a trillion 5 1 2 million million 600,000 so, okay. 1 5 so, yeah, the full thing can be watched 000, online 3 but billion does anyone have any questions 1 25 25 12 55 50,000 1 47 40 million thousand yep. thousands of 2009 70s 80s 90s 50s 50 0 50 1 140, 60s, 19, 1960, Thank you very much. Um, we were coming back to this notion of uh, the machines being dumb, actually. Um, I'm working as a science journalist a lot. Um, I'm interviewing AI researchers a lot. And I, if I'm not mistaken, there's something happening right now, uh, which is a shift from supervised learning to uns unsupervised learning. Mm -hmm. So do you think that something interesting could happen as well when it comes to creativity or kind of a more autonomous way of the machines learning things that could surprise us once they're not supervised anymore? Yeah, absolutely. I'm fascinated by that. Um, I think unsupervised, it's important to be like clear in distinctions. So supervised is when you're labeling the data set that's going in. Unsupervised is when there are no labels anymore. So like with the birds, it didn't know what those images were of necessarily, and it started to generate images. I think the really interesting thing is what DeepMind are working on is, is reinforcement learning. Um, and you know, DeepMind are pushing as hard as they can to try and create these artificial general intelligence, um, something that is capable of performing any task and I think that is fascinating. And I think you know, that's the Max Tegmark diagram where art is kind of the final frontier. Um, I don't know what it would mean to, <laughs> for, for an algorithm to be creating art. I, you know, I think it, it is such a human thing. I think it'd be fascinating to see what an algorithm creating art for another machine could be. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I'm not so interested in going down the singularity theory route. I'm quite planted in today and what are the sort of questions that are facing us right now. And I think it's important to be thinking of these things in terms of collaboration with humans. And I think that's where they're most effective and interesting. I like the idea that maybe they're going to become more and more democratized and anyone can train a neural network in the near future to do a creative task and help them. and. You know, I think that could be a really interesting route. 
Well, I would have a, a very, very basic question. Uh, it's almost dumb, actually. So um, you said that uh, you are, or you didn't say that, but uh, but actually uh, you don't paint uh, these images, these abstract images, and you said that the professors uh, uh, suggested that uh, you would do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, why? <laughs> <laughs> why don't I paint, or why did they suggest that I did? Uh, why you don't paint them? Why don't I paint? Oh, goodness. My dad's a painter. <laughs> Maybe that's why. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm interested in, yeah, moving beyond that. I've always been fascinated by technology and seeing how far I can, you know, when I was a little kid and everyone was playing computer games, I was always on Photoshop or in After Effects or doing 3D rendering and using the tools that existed. And then I became really interested in, in writing my own tools. And there's some wonderful programming languages with brilliant communities for creatives like open frameworks and processing um, where you can start to create your own tools for making generative art. But I think some of the issue with that is that a lot of the work that you can produce in that doesn't really have much criticality. Or there's not so much narrative. Um, I mean, absolutely can be, but I think a lot of the work that is made with it. Um, and then I became more and more interested in the philosophical idea of how far you can push an algorithm to produce something without the artist, but the artist sort of sets it off, like systems art, like you know, the masters of Sol LeWitt or John Cage or you know, Duchamp, they, they would set up a system and, and use randomness and chance. And I think now we're in a really important era where we have these algorithms that are starting to produce results. You can open up the hidden layer of a neural network and not understand how it's coming to the conclusions that it's coming to. And I think that's a really extraordinary moment. And I think you can use art to communicate that and to talk about that. Um, so yeah, no, I think, I think that's what really excites me is, is using these algorithms and, and now that it's moving away from just being something that I'm using as a tool and controlling, I think, you know, it is still a tool, but it's it's, it's moving beyond. We can't completely comprehend how it's seeing the world. And I think that's really exciting for a visual person to be given back unexpected results when I'm setting off these algorithms. So, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm.